This is going to be the next lesson in the Bible Institute. Last time we looked at the reconstruction of the earth. We looked at day one through seven. And I told you we was going to skip day six with the, about the creation of man and land animals. And we was going to go back and look at it because that's going to be our next big scene that we're going to look at. So day six... You got the creation of man. This will lead us into another scene in the scriptures. Some people call it the dispensation of innocence. Okay, so the title of this scene could be Days of Adam Before the Fall. You can title it however you want to in your notes, but I got it wrote down, The Days of Adam Before the Fall. Okay, the steward... Of this is Adam. The main characters, God, Adam, Eve, and the serpent. Okay, the account is Genesis 128 through Genesis 3. It's from the creation of man to the fall. The length of time is unknown, possibly 40 days. Possibly three and a half years. But definitely less than 130 years. And we'll go into that more. The responsibilities that was given to Adam is he's to name the animals, dress and keep the garden, be fruitful and multiply. The symbol or token of the agreement with Adam is the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life. The test given to Adam is would they eat from the forbidden tree? Are they going to eat from the forbidden tree? That's the test. And that's Genesis 2, 15 through 17. But the agreement is for, is for Adam to remain in paradise without working, sweating, pain, sickness, sorrow, or any death. He can do those things as long as he doesn't eat off of that tree. He can remain in paradise, having a great life forever, as long as he doesn't eat off the tree. He won't have to worry about working, sweating, pain, sickness, sorrow, or death. And this agreement is known by most people as the Edenic Covenant. The Edenic Covenant. E-D-E-N-I-C. Edenic Covenant. And of course, you know, the failure is they ate off for the tree. They went ahead and did it. That's Genesis 3-6. Adam ate off the tree. Eve ate off the tree. Okay, the judgment is Adam lost his job. He was kicked out of the garden that he was told to dress and to keep. And uh, Genesis 3, 23 through 24 is where you see that. So Genesis 1, 24 through 25 says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and every thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Okay, so God makes man here. And if you turn over to Genesis chapter 2, it gives you more detail on the creation of man. And he says in Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So you see we started with the breath of God. I'm breathing right now because that one breath that he breathed into Adam's nostrils it started it all. He formed his body from the dust but his soul came from God's breath. And we all are made up of three parts, a body, a soul, 
and a spirit. As it talks about in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it shows you have a spirit, soul, and a body. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That was his when he got the living soul. And God formed him out of the dust of the ground. That's his body. And in Genesis 2.8, it says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And you see, the Bible is a circle. If you want to know the end, then you can just look at the beginning. Just like it says in Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning. And he puts him in this garden of Eden. And Ezekiel 36.35 says, And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. You see, when it's all said and done, it will go back to like it was in the beginning. It will be like being in the Garden of Eden. And Eden means well watered or fruitful. You see, Adam would have been like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brought forth his fruit in his season and his leaf wouldn't have withered. He would have had fellowship with the angel of the Lord, who, as you'll see in chapter 3, would walk through the garden in the cool of the day. Genesis 2, 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You see that tree of life? It won't be the last time you see it. Because... The Bible's a circle. It comes back again in the end. Revelation twenty two fourteen says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. That tree of life comes back. You can declare the end from the beginning. If you want to know what the end looks like, look at the beginning. We've already seen that the Garden of Eden, they're going to say, Everything looks like the Garden of Eden, and the Tree of Life comes back. That Tree of Life is the token or the symbol of this agreement with Adam. If in his innocence he passes the test, he would be considered righteous by not eating off the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. And then he would get to eat off the Tree of Life. This is just speculation, but... Since we know that Adam and Eve never ate off the tree of life while they were in their innocent state, it is likely that God was waiting for them to be tested by the serpent and have him test them with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He was waiting for that before he had them eat off the tree of life to live forever. And if he would have passed up on eating off the forbidden tree, he could have lived forever in the garden with Eve replenish the creation that the sons of God, you know, Lucifer and many of the angels rebelled from and, and lost. He could have replenished that creation that those sons of God lost and lived in complete fulfillment and happiness forever. And the tree of life was most likely an olive tree. You see, Jesus Christ is our tree of life. Romans eleven seventeen calls him the olive tree. And you see, all of these scenes that we're going to look at will have Jesus Christ showing up or will have something that typifies or pictures him in some way. But Jesus Christ is our olive tree. Most likely, the tree of life was an olive tree. And here are seven, this is just interesting, here are seven kinds of trees that we can speculate about being in the Garden of Eden. Number one, the olive tree, which would have been the tree of life. And that would picture Jesus Christ, Romans eleven seventeen. Number two, the fig tree. We know this was in there somewhere because Adam and Eve, as you're going to see later, will sew fig leaves together and make themselves, make themselves aprons in Genesis 3, 7. And the, the fig tree is a picture of self-righteousness. Number three, a vine tree. And I believe that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a vine tree. 
and that's it's gonna a vine tree has grapes and the fruit of the vine is the only fruit in the Bible that's forbidden in number six three. And also on top of that, uh, grape juice or wine in the Bible is a picture of blood. And throughout the Bible, you're forbidden to drink blood. So it makes sense that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a vine tree. Number four, a bramble tree. It's got prickly stuff on it. This has to do with the curse and thorns. That it talks about in Genesis 3, 19. Number five, the fir tree. This is the fruitful tree. See Hosea 14, 8. Six, cedar trees. And that's what's used for the house of God in 1 Kings 5, 6. And number seven, a chestnut tree. It talks about it in Genesis 30 and verse 37. I just thought that was interesting to throw in there. Seven kinds of trees that we can speculate were in the Garden of Eden. Now, Genesis 2 and verse 10. And a river, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Bedellium and the onyx stone. And it kind of makes you wonder if the Lord formed Adam from ground that had some gold dust. And he could have sparkled a bit from that. Kind of like the cherubim in Ezekiel 1-7, they sparkle like the color of burnished brass. So possibly Adam in his innocent state before he fell may have had some gold in there. Also consider how when Lucifer was in Eden before he fell, Look what it says about him in Ezekiel twenty-eight thirteen. Talking about the devil, it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now look what it says. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So you see, Lucifer had gold built into him. He had that onyx stone built into him. And what's said to be there in that, that land where Adam was is gold and onyx stone in Genesis 2.12. Perhaps some of what was on Lucifer and some of the creatures that fell were left behind in debris on the earth after the flood of the original creation. Just speculation. Something you talk about amongst each other on a rainy day or something. But I just think there's something there. How it mentions gold and the onyx stone in Genesis 2.12. And also uh, mentions, you know, in the context of Eden. And then Ezekiel 28.13 talking about Eden. And once again, all those precious stones again. Now Genesis 1.26. And God said... Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So he said, let us make man in our image. Notice he said our. Who is he referring to? He's referring to the Godhead, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. First John 5, 7, it says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So you you got, there are three and one and one and three. Not three gods, but one God that manifests himself in three persons. And that's as far as I take it. I can't, can, I can't explain the Godhead. Never been able to. I don't even really want to try to because, you know, I can't, um, my mind just can't, fathom God completely. So God made man in his image that would be spiritually. He made him in his image that would be spiritually speaking. Adam was in the image of God at the start. He did not have to be born again like me and you. Me and you had to be born again to have the image of God. But Adam 
was in it, the image of God right when he was created. Luke 3.38 says that Adam was the son of God. Adam was the, a son of God because he was a direct creation from God. Me and you do not become sons of God until we believe on Jesus Christ. When you were a lost man, you were not a son of God. In John 1.12 it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So you're not a son of God until you believe on him. Adam was a son of God the moment he came about. Adam didn't have to become a son of God. He was one when he was formed out of the dust of the earth. You see, Adam had, was a lot different than our situation in many aspects. He didn't have an earthly mother or father. He was the first man. And since he was a direct creation from God, he is called a son of God. That's significant because God's plan was for Adam and his wife to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Replenish because something had been there before. The previous sons of God, which weren't humans, I'm not teaching a pre-Adamic human race, the previous sons of God weren't humans, they were the angels and Lucifer, as we talked about in those previous lessons, they, they failed. You know, Lucifer got lifted up in pride, he rebelled, took some of the angels with him. But now Adam is given the command to be fruitful and multiply so that he can replace those sons of God which fail. Genesis 1, 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So he made him in his image, and after his likeness. The image had to do with the soul, and the likeness had to do with the body. So he gave him dominion. Before... Lucifer had dominion. Here's another way you know there was a there had to be a gap between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2 because Adam and Lucifer couldn't have had dominion at the same time. Lucifer's dominion was in that gap. Now Adam has the dominion. So what you have is the devil up there in the second heaven looking down and seeing the reconstruction of the earth and the creation of man, and he's upset. And when the Lord asked the devil, where he comes from, what does he say? From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. So this shows he's very interested in what man is doing and most likely full of envy and bitterness. And he's, he's upset about Adam having dominion. So now he is going to try and mess it all up. So Adam was formed with the ability and strength to dress and keep a garden up. The Lord gave him a job right away. In Genesis 2.15, it says, And the Lord took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Maybe you are doing a work for the Lord that only you and God can see. Only Adam and God would have seen his work in the garden because he was the only one around. Maybe it seems like in your Christian life you are completely unnoticed, but it's not true. God can see it, and that's all that matters. That is the only person you need to please. There was nobody else around at this time, yet God would have been pleased with the work that Adam was doing. Maybe nobody knows about the work you're doing. If you're doing a work from God for God from the heart, God sees it and he's pleased with it. It, it doesn't matter about all the other billion people in the world. It says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. So it's about pleasing God, not men. And that's what Adam would have been doing if, while he was doing that work in the garden. You'll notice that Adam was formed very intelligent. And since Adam didn't have an earthly mother or father, there was never a time when he would have been a baby or a small child. He could have been formed a full-grown man. He was already very smart. He had the ability to dress and keep a garden right when he was made. and He was very intelligent enough to name the animals. 
In Genesis 2, 18 and 19, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So he's intelligent enough to name all these numerous amounts of animals. This sixth day should remind you that if you are a son of God like Adam, then you are in the image of God. Maybe the first time you were born, you thought you didn't have a purpose. But now that you're saved, you're born again and you have a purpose. He put Adam to, to work right away. He gave him a garden to dress it and to keep it. He gave him these animals to name them. You see, as sons of God, we have a purpose. You can go to work for the Lord right away. In Genesis 1.27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So why are you here? Because God wanted to fellowship with man. He saw it fit to make man. And in Revelation 4.11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That's why we were created to give God pleasure and to fellowship with God. He created male and female. Notice that as well. He made a difference there. A man should be a man. A woman should be a woman. There is a difference between a man and a woman. And in Genesis 2.21, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So God performed the first surgery here. He got... Uh, he cut Adam in his side, just like the Lord Jesus Christ was cut in his side when he was on the cross. So both Adam and the Lord Jesus were cut in their sides. In John 19, 34, it says, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, he was making it possible to get his bride. Because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross, he made it possible for me and you to be born again, be put in the body of Christ, and form the bride of Christ. The bride is made up of every born-again believer. We also make up the body of Christ, the church. And just as Jesus Christ faced death to get his bride, Adam faced death to get his bride. He had a deep sleep come on him. Sleep is a picture of death in the Bible. And he was pierced in his side just as Jesus got pierced in his side. In Genesis 2, through 23, it says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Eve was bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh, just as we are with the Lord. In Ephesians 5, through 23, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So when a woman tries to run the home, she ruins the marriage being an illustration of Jesus Christ and the church. Because me and you as the bride, we don't run Jesus Christ. He's the head. He runs us. It says in Ephesians 5, 24 through 25, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands, their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The man is the head, but since he's supposed to love his wife, she is completely taken care of and watched after and led away from deception. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Now see this, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, just as Eve was with Adam. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. It says in Ephesians 5, 31 through 33, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, 
and they too shall be one flesh, just like Adam and Eve were. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So you can see the t type and picture is very strong. Adam and Eve are a picture of Jesus Christ and the bride of Christ. Adam being a picture of the Lord Jesus. Eve being a picture of the bride of Christ. Genesis 2, 24 through 25, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, see, just like it said in Ephesians, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And this is a sign of innocence. They had no knowledge of good and evil before they ate off of the tree. Innocence isn't righteousness, and it's not sinfulness. It, it doesn't become sin or righteous until it's been tested. And once it's been tested, it will then become sinful or righteous. Compare this to a child who is innocent. He has no knowledge of good and evil. He hasn't ever believed on Jesus Christ. He doesn't understand that he sinned against God. It's like it says in Romans 7, 8, and 9, Paul said, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. He says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. He said, you know, before, um, before I realized I had broke God's commands, that I'd sinned against the Almighty God, I was alive. But when the commandment came, he realized he broke the laws. He was exposed to the, to the scriptures and seen that he was a sinner. He died, and he needed to be born again. He was alive without the law once before he reached what people call the age of accountability. Then the commandment came, and he died and needed to be born again. See, before you realize you're a sinner and that you sin against God, you're safe. The moment you realize that you're a sinner and you broke God's laws, you sinned against him, you're not safe anymore. You need to be born again. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 4.15 says, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there's no transgression. So before a person understands that they are a sinner and in need of a Savior, they are innocent, kind of like Adam and Eve, and the ages vary on when they reach this age of accountability. And Genesis 1.28 says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So they are to be fruitful and multiply. They need to replenish that which had been made empty. They have dominion. The crown that was on Lucifer has now been placed on Adam. He has dominion now. He is a king over the spiritual kingdom of God because he has the image of God. He is a king over the physical kingdom of heaven because he's got dominion over every living thing. And Genesis 1.29 says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. So they could have they could have had anything they wanted. All the trees were pleasant to the sight. The only thing they couldn't have was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2.16, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. They could freely eat from many of the trees. Freely eat. Just as you look at God's salvation, it's free. The things God gives you is free. And see, they uh, were to eat the fruit of the trees, except for the one tree. They were vegetarians. They weren't, they weren't eating the animals. The animals were just their friends. And Genesis 2, 17, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So there is the warning. This tree is the test. This, this tree of knowledge of good and evil is the test. 
It says in Genesis 1, 30 through 31, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Six is the number of man, so it makes sense that they're created on the sixth day. Notice at the end of each day, it says the evening and the morning. It says the evening first, because the evening is the start of the day on the, on the Hebrew calendar. But you could apply that to yourself as well, because your day really does start in the evening. You see, before you go to bed, you need to meditate on the things of God that will cause you to have a better night's sleep. You need to be sure to go to bed at a decent time so that you aren't so tired and more vulnerable to the flesh in the morning. You need to get things ready for the morning in the evening so that you have more time to spend with God in the morning. For example, I'll get out the clothes I'm going to put on. I'll get my keys and my wallet, everything ready. And in five minutes after my alarm in the morning, I'm ready to go. You see, the evening, what you do in the evening prepares you for the next day. What you do in the evening make, can make you feel really good in the morning or make you feel really bad in the morning. You see, in the length of time that Adam and Eve were in innocence is unknown. I've heard different theories. Some say it could have been 40 days because 40 days represents testing in the Bible. For example, Jesus was tempted as he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. For example, Goliath presented himself before Israel for 40 days. So perhaps Adam was created and he and Eve were in the garden in innocence for 40 days. We don't know. That's a possibility. Another possibility is we know that Jesus Christ is the last Adam, as he's called that. So that sets up Jesus Christ as the model for Adam, obviously. Jesus began his ministry at 30 years of age. And went on about three and a half years and then died on a tree for our sins. He passed every test, being in all points tempted like as we are. It makes sense to say that Adam was most likely formed to look like a full-grown 30-year-old man. And possibly he went three and a half years after that in innocence. And then when it came time for the test involving a tree... He failed the test, whereas Jesus Christ was victorious. You see, Adam made off of the wrong tree and lost out on eternal life from the tree of life. And by this, he brought sin into the world. Whereas Jesus Christ willingly died on the tree and became sin for us, and now he becomes our tree of life. Whereas Adam could have passed the test and per partook off the tree of life, we look at Jesus Christ who hung on a tree and trusts in his finished work on that tree, his, his death, his burial, and resurrection, and we get eternal life. And remember that Jesus Christ is called the branch. And men are compared to trees in the Bible. The blind guy said, I see men as trees walking. Jesus Christ is our tree of life. All the nature worshipers worship the wrong trees. Jesus is the tree of life. And that's what the tree of life actually pictures is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Jesus began his ministry at 30 years, continued on three and a half years after that. Adam most likely was formed to look like a 30-year-old man. Maybe he continued on three and a half years after that, had a test in a garden involving a tree in which he failed and brought sin to the world, whereas Jesus started his ministry at 30 years, continued on three and a half years, died on a tree, passed the test, and now offers eternal life to everybody, whereas the first Adam brought sin into the life of everybody. So that's a possibility there. Maybe Adam and Eve were in innocence three and a half years before the test. Well, we don't know how long for certain that Adam was in innocence, but we know that it was definitely less than 130 years because Adam was 130 years old when he had Seth. And Seth was born after Cain had already killed Abel. So Cain and Abel were at least old enough to kill each other when, they, when, they, uh, when Cain killed Abel. 
So you're probably looking at the time of innocence lasting less than 115 years, probably much shorter than that. We know for certain it can't be, it can't be, they couldn't have been in innocence more than 130 years because um, that's how old Adam was when he had Seth. So you're probably looking at, you could probably definitely say less than 100 years. But we may never know. But that was the scene of Adam and Eve in innocence. The days of Adam before the fall. What people commonly call the dispensation of innocence. Where you have what people commonly refer to as the Edenic Covenant. They could do anything they wanted except eat off the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 